All right. Hello, everybody. So my name is Emmanuel, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Bordeaux. I'm also affiliated at the Center of Research of in Economics and Statistics in Paris. I'm going to talk to you about how to help the Bordeaux wine producers to improve their forecast for next year prices. So, as you may know, um, Europe experienced a severe uh, frost uh, event last April. And uh, it was especially harsh in Bordeaux, where the next harvest is expected to be reduced of between 50 and 70 percent. So prices are likely to increase, and everybody is trying to react to that news. And if we were on a major agricultural market, uh, the economic agent would have been able to hedge against this price risk before uh, using the future market. But no such future market exists for wine. So the, the agents are reduced to make their own private uh, price expectations. And for that, they use so far uh, only private uh, expertise or even opinion. And now they wish to use more statistical uh, objective methods. And uh, so that's the purpose of this paper. So my question will be, to what extent uh, those prices are predictable in the sense that uh, to what extent can we beat the naive forecast that next year is going to be the same as uh, current prices? Next year prices will be the, the same. Uh, so, what data did I use? Uh, the, the joint trade organization provided the market statistics uh, for the main 15 appellations of origin or vintage mix. So I put two data sets, uh, the first on the annual frequency with the price, uh, quantity sold, exported, harvested and stored at the end of uh, each year and starts in 1982. At the monthly frequency I have the price, quantity sold, exported and stored for each of the appellations, but it only starts in August 2001, so the series is very short, it's shorter. Um, so to forecast those prices, uh, I also collected information on other price determinants using publicly available data on quality, quality scores from various sources, uh, the wine harvests of all the wine producing countries, uh, the exchange rates against the euro since uh, border wines are largely exported, uh, the the GDP of all the border wine importing countries. And last but not least also, I have weather data of the region of border because we know that, for instance, right now, everybody's reacting to the weather shock that happened last month. Uh, so the, my purpose here is to combine all this information to predict the, the, the average price for next year. And one issue will be the the problem of the bias, the, the trade-off between bias and variance. Because we, we wish to add as many predictors as we can to have a, a theoretically more accurate model. But um, uh, also adding many, many, many pro predictors, it, uh, it causes the model to be harder to estimate. So it increases the estimation variance and thus the forecasting error. And it can also cause the, the coefficients to have wrong signs, like if you, if you have too many predictors with too, too little data, you can have maybe estimate the impact, that the, the impact of the quality uh, on prices is negative, which is absurd. So I have to, to, de to deal with this uh, overfitting problem, especially on the annual data. So this is what the series looked like. The red line is the, the price, the orange bars are the inventories at the, start, the beginning of each year, the green bars are the, the harvests of each year. So you can see there is a significant volatility in both prices, uh, inventory and harvest. And this was to show that uh, the, the monthly data only starts in 2001, so it's a little bit after the, the half of the history. So it misses a large part of the history, but it also provides more observation of prices so that uh, this overfitting problem that I mentioned will be less an issue at the monthly level. 
but it's uncertain which data set is more suited to uh, estimate a model for next year price. So what I did, I, I did uh, different strategies for both data sets and uh, compared the, the, relative the respective performance of each models. Alright, so I first needed to combine all this information of the, all those predictors. Um, so all the quality scores, the national harvest for by country, the, all the exchange rates and the GDP were aggregated into four indicators, which are just weighted means of all those, uh, uh, the series of uh, for each countries. The weights being computed based on the, the, the information on exports. Also, I've normalized the, the harvest and the stocks by the quantity sold each year to have stationary, more stationary indicators. And uh, at the monthly level, I had to remove the irregular and seasonal component of the price and the volumes uh, to have a better measure of the, the correlation of the, the, the average level. Uh, so I used for that the standard uh, unobserved component model which I'm not going to detail, but because it's standard, but here, what's look, what it looks like. So the above plot is the, the monthly stocks for one uh, main operation on, in Bordeaux. So you can see the, the high, of course, the high seasonality of the stocks with the harvest coming each year. And the, so the black line is the observed stocks and the blue line is the unobserved uh, underlying level of the stocks, which is estimated by this method. So you can see that it's smoother. And also, uh, this method allows to get rid of the irregular component of the price, uh, which, uh, which you can see on the bottom graph. Like we, you, you want to get rid of those little variations that seem to have no effect on the long-term uh, long prices. And, uh, the right part of the graph are the, the forecasting methods, so the, the forecasting results, which I'm going to, to explain now. So what model did I use? Well, very standard model, actually. At the annual frequency, I considered auto-distributed lags model in level first difference and uh, also error correction models with one lag. So those are only linear models where the price is, is regressed on the predictors and the lags of prices and predictors. Uh, <coughs> so to deal with the overfitting issue and also, but to make sure to use all the data properly, I estimated on the annual frequency all the possible sets of predictors, all combination of the six uh, predictors, so about 500 models, and the final forecast is a combination of the, the 10 most effective. Uh, 10 most effective in the sense that they were the 10 most effective at forecasting the last, the past two, year, two, the price of the past two years. Sorry. Um, <coughs> so at the monthly frequency, as I said, overfitting is less an issue. So uh, I only consider the most suited model, which is a, a standard error correction model for each appellation with up to six lags for both prices and the predictors. And the specification of which lags to select and which predictors to include was made by minimizing the standard criterion uh, AIC. So another issue with forecasting is that you need to actually predict the predictors because you regress price on current exchange rates, but then if you want to predict next year price, you need to predict as well exchange rate. Well, of course, I'm not predicting really exchange rates. So for the, the GDP, the national harvests, and the exchange rates, the, the forecast of those predictors is just uh, the naive forecast that they won't change. But for the quality, I can use harvest reports and also the weather data. Um, for the quantity and the stocks, I use the, the level predicted by the, the estimated uh, unobserved component models. So this kind of prediction uh, above. And for the harvest, I use a specific metal, meteorological model, uh, which I'm not going to detail, but uh, it involves uh, here age the harvest, so it's the product of the area cultivated times the yield, 
and I have a specific equation for the yield which I know are regulated so this is a truncated regression knowing the maximum yield of each year and, uh, and WT is the weather variables. Okay, so this was just to, to show you that it, this harvest model is especially effective at predicting low, low uh, harvest shocks, like in 2008 and 2013. When the green dots are the, the predicted uh, harvests and the blue dots are the naive forecast for the harvest. <coughs> so this was used to evaluate the performance of the, the forecasting model of the price because if you want to evaluate uh, you need to make yourself in the position that you're forecasting the past price using past information. So what was uh, the information of, uh, on the harvest uh, last July uh, to simulate this information of uh, past harvest at that time, I used this model. So now the results. Uh, <coughs> on the past five years, uh, you have here in the dark blue that's the results of the monthly model and light blue is the annual model. So that's not perfect but they captured the trend and they were successful at predicting the direction of the price each year more or less except in 2014 for the monthly model. Uh, so the annual model was actually slightly more effective than the monthly model so right now it's more useful to use all the harvest history than to use uh, the monthly series, very slightly. And they are, so they are slightly more accurate than the naive, model, the naive forecast, like five or three percent. And so for next year, and what's the impact of the frost? Uh, so next year, our forecast, both model agrees that it should be around 1,400 euros. And you can see that the price is already going up right now. So the average price since the beginning of the year is 1,258. And last month it was already 1,300. Uh, <coughs> all right, so that was just to show you that the results of the monthly model may be less accurate at predicting the average, uh, the, the average of next prices, next year prices. But it provides also richer results so that you have the, the dynamics of the price <coughs> and other stocks. Okay, so <coughs> as a wrap up, those, those forecasting methods uh, managed to beat the, the naive forecast on average for the last five years. And, uh, well, price is likely to increase next year. Thank you.